Hey, Dad, thanks for taking time today to have a cool conversation. You know, I've been waiting my whole life to have this conversation start. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, what do you want to talk about? I want to talk about the most important thing I've learned in since 1980 when I became a chiropractor. So for 40 years, I've been working with people. Yeah. And one of the things that I learned when I was a chiropractor, I, I, I became a chiropractor because I wanted to learn more about nutrition. I had a degree in psychology and I noticed as when I became a vegetarian when I was like 19, what I ate really affected my mood. And I didn't know it, what that was, but there was a profound difference when I ate a certain way. And I really decided that that had more of an influence on my own psychology than everything that I learned in psychology. You know, psychology came out of philosophy and physiology and psychology. So philosophy, you know, our way of life, our way of thinking. Physiology, our body health. And then psychology, our mental health. Well, what I had discovered was that our physiological health, our body health, has a huge effect on our mental health. Yeah. And although it's important that we think correctly and that we not think ourselves into depression and anxiety and you know, disease, it's probably more important that we be physically healthy because we that influences our mental health more so than, than at least the psychological methods that I learned, you know, back in the seventies of to, you know, counsel people. So I get to chiropractic and what I find is that the number one complaint from patients wasn't a bad back. It was low energy. Uh -huh. Everybody complained about not having enough energy. And I learned to do what was called a glucose tolerance test. And this was, we used a, uh, a finger prick with a glucometer and a strip where you would get a drop of blood, you'd put it on this strip and you'd put it into this meter and it would tell you what your serum, what your blood glucose level was. So I would have people come in the morning and I would feed them a couple of bananas, a couple of dates, and a couple of oranges. The, the, the established way of doing a glucose tolerance test is to have people drink a bottle of incredibly sweet Coca-Cola. It's not really Coca-Cola, but man, it's as sweet, just like pure sugar water. So yeah. I learned, you know, hey, give them some real sugar. Mm. And, then, and I had them take their glucose um, test before they ate that. And then I had, I put them in a room and oftentimes it was a parent and their child. And they both did this together. And they poked their fingers every 15 minutes and marked down what the level was. And they did this for six hours. So that's 24 pokes. And they ate this real sweet breakfast, nothing else, for the next six hours. And at the end of it, they handed me their results. And what I saw was that the blood sugar started off, you know, and it went up, and it went down. And it went up, and it went down. And in the first three or four hours, it went up and down pretty quickly. In the last three hours, it was going up and down, not as high or as low, and not as quickly. But you basically had this graph, and blood sugar normally, if you fasted for 12 hours, is gonna be between 70 and 85. And after you eat, and the sugar is digested, or, or your food is digested, and food is basically converted into sugar. Food being protein, fats, and carbs, those are your macronutrients. 
and then your micronutrients are water, enzymes, vitamins, and minerals. That's what we eat, macronutrients and micronutrients. So when you eat protein, fat, and carbs, that all has to be broken down and it's converted into sugar, which then gets into your blood and is then used to fuel the body. That's the gasoline, that's the energy source. So when you eat something that's really, really sweet, it raises the blood sugar quickly in your blood. And so in 15 minutes, you'll see your blood sugar go from 70 to 120. It can go up. I, generally, that's about what happens is you're, if you're eating well, your blood sugar is going to go from that fasting level of around 70 to 85. And it's going to go up to 120, 130, something like that. But if you eat two dates, two bananas, and two oranges, initially your blood sugar might spike up to 140 or 160. When you're doing this test um, in the 80s, was all they had was that, for that six hour period, all they had was the three things that you gave them in the morning and that was it? Correct. And then you saw their blood sugar go up and down, up and down, up and down. So exactly. kind of what, what was happening um, physiologically? What, what well, this is, this, is, this is the way that it works, is that you eat a food, it's broken down, it's absorbed into the body, and it's broken down and it's converted into glucose. Mm -hmm. That glucose gets into your bloodstream, and that's the fuel that your body uses to do all of its functions. Okay. So when the blood sugar gets up to 140, 160, that's way too high. So how would that happen? How would your blood sugar get too high? By eating solid carbohydrates, fruits, dates, bananas, and oranges. That's all carbs. And that is quickly digested and it quickly is converted into sugar and it raises your blood sugar up too high. When blood sugar is too high, it's called hyperglycemia. And the disease that's associated with that is called diabetes. Mm, which, what is half the US population or something? Half of adults in the United States now have diabetes. Wow. Which, without insulin, they would die. Would, so the start of diabetes, would that be when sugar consumption became normal? Like, I kind of read in this book called Sugar Blues, that the average poundage per year that people consumed of sugar was like maybe a pound or something. And then all of a sudden it skyrocketed to like 50 pounds or something a year. And that's when diabetes just took off. Is that kind of the culprit in a way? It is. And, and it, it has to do with eating the right balance of those protein, fats, and carbs. And that's what I want to talk about. Yeah. But first, I want to kind of explain this whole mechanism of this glucose tolerance test. And, and I think if people can understand this, because really, Stuart, if there was one thing out of the 40 years of information that I've learned, if I could teach one thing to the world, it would be about blood sugar control. That's the most and, crucial. And I have a lot of clients who have blood sugar control problems. And I spend a lot of time trying to educate them about this. Mm -hmm. And I have a hit or a miss success. Mm -hmm. Some people just don't get it. And that's what I'm trying to do in this 15 minutes is to share with people that we're, talk that we're gonna be talking to what this really, really means. So that's why I'm starting with this glucose tolerance test and illustrating that your blood sugar when you eat goes up. And when it goes up too high, your pancreas' job is to produce insulin, which allows the cells in your body to open up to allow the sugar that's in the blood to go to the cells. That's what insulin's job is. When the, and, and, and then that, so after we eat, our blood sugar is gonna go up, it, and, and we'll talk about how to prevent it from going up too quickly and too high. 
that it's going to go up, then the natural process is that insulin is produced, it lowers it, and ideally, it's going to stay somewhere between 70 and 85. We have a mechanism that allows us to eat once a day, and, and that blood sugar is, is going to be regulated, and it's regulated by the insulin when it gets too high, and when it gets too low, it's regulated by something called glucagon, which goes to the liver and it releases stored glucose to raise it up. So it's sort of like a, a thermostat that automatically keeps your house temperature at 70 degrees. When it gets too cold, turns the heat on. When it gets too hot, turns the heat down. So we've got sort of this automatic regulatory system. And that would work if we only eat, like a lot of people eat one meal a day. Mm. Yeah, or they, or they, they skip their breakfast, they skip lunch, and they maybe have dinner, or they wait for hours after they wake up, have something. Hit or, it's sort of hit or miss. It's not on a schedule. Uh -huh. And that's a big mistake. And the reason is that if we're doing that hit or miss eating, then we're relying on these mechanisms of our body to regulate our blood sugar. And that's sort of an expensive proposition. That takes energy, that causes wear and tear on a system. And a much better way to take care of ourselves for the long term and to keep our daily energy going See, this is what I discovered when I was a vegetarian. And if I didn't eat right, my energy was like, no, and I'm going to school. So I got to study, you know, I, it's, it's an intense time of my life. And if I didn't have energy to study, you know, I, I, I drink coffee and I stress myself out. And yeah. if, I ate, if I ate the right way, I noticed that I just kind of kept zooming instead of woo, 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 woo. And right. I didn't know it at the time, but that was blood sugar control that I had discovered. And as a vegetarian, I was eating way too many fruits and vegetables and not enough protein and fats. And I didn't know much about it all. Would you so, say m most people kind of, most people that you've worked with, is that the case, the scenario that they eat way too many carbs and not enough? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's not just refined sugar. Yeah, Carb, everything is turned into sugar, but carbs, which are fruits, vegetables, and berries, and grains, and beans, those are carbs. Mm -hmm. Those are converted really quickly into sugar, whereas protein takes longer, and fat takes longer. So that's why we, we start talking about this ratio. Like building so, a fire almost. You got to use all three different kinds of fuels if you want a sustained, enjoyable yeah. campfire. Paper, kindling, and hardwood. Yeah. And, and the hardwood is, is the fat. The, the kindling is the protein. And the paper is the carbohydrates. So what, what this, this test was really interesting because it, was, it told you a lot more than just blood sugar levels. Because... Huh. If the blood sugar went up to 140, 160, and then 15 minutes later it went down to 40, that means you've got a problem. And, and if it goes from 40, now what caused it to go down was the production of insulin. Then when it's, when it's too high. Then when it's too low, glucagon is, is released and it allows stored sugar to raise it up again. But because it's too low, it goes too high. And, and then when it's too high, too much insulin is produced and it goes too low. And then it, then too low is, is goes too high. So it's so, not a very efficient tool. No. And this would every, for six hours, that blood sugar was going, woo, 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 woo. And, and it's interesting because every hour of that test tells you a little about, about a different gland. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was a very incredible test. And when I found that people were hypoglycemic or mm. hyperglycemic, if they were developing diabetes and, and both of those states being hypoglycemic, 
you're on the road to being hyperglycemic. So it's all on this continuum. And when I discovered that, and when I told people, okay, this is how you control that, it changed people's lives. And this was when I was a newbie, and it just started working with patients. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most dramatic things that I did, was throw people into a room for six hours, have them poke their fingers 25 times, and, and it, it changed their lives, it changed their children's lives. Now that's not to say that as a chiropractor, you know, I would adjust somebody's neck and their headache would go away. Or I would adjust somebody's mid-back and their heartburn would go away, their, their shoulders would work. So I saw miracles with chiropractic that were really amazing, but one of the biggest miracles was this glucose tolerance test and the people that I discovered were hyperglycemic. Or, or developing diabetes. So what now, then, then, you know, as you know, I started working at a hormone lab and we did adrenal testing. And adrenal testing is, is interesting because we would measure the, the level of, of cortisol in the blood and DHEA. And these are two hormones produced by the adrenals. And that also is a rhythm. So in the early morning, your cortisol levels are at their peak. And as the day progresses, cortisol levels lower. And then three hours after the sun goes down, it's at its lowest peak. And then you get a, a melatonin hormone, which is sort of your sleep hormone that, that starts to rise up. So you look at, again, the rhythm of these hormones going up and down. Mm. And I saw a lot of early morning cortisol levels that were really low. And mm. these are the people that when they wake up, they wake up tired. And, and you could tell by looking at their cortisol rhythm when their energy periods were during the day. And so I knew when I was consulting with these people what time to call them because I didn't want to call them when their levels were low and they were kind of asleep right it's pretty amazing that's cool and, and, and so what i found and and so we were taught in this hormone lab to give people things that supported their adrenals just for and, that therapy is yeah and and one of these was pregnenolone because pregnenolone is a hormone that the adrenals use to make the cortisol and so you give them the precursor that they needed for the adrenal gland to work they were kind of okay, but not really. And one of the reasons why we were testing adrenals so much is we were looking, it was really a female hormone lab. So we were measuring progesterone and estrogen and testosterone, mostly in women and young women that had PMS, premenstrual syndrome. And that means before the menses, their hormone levels would get low and that's what causes PMS. And so, and it's, there's two phases in the female cycle from the, you know, from the first day of their, of their cycle, their period, their hormones are very low. And then in the first 10 days, the estrogen levels go up 10 to 14 days. And then that causes the ovary to release an egg that's ovulation. And then the sac that the egg is released from starts to produce progesterone. And then progesterone goes into the cycle. So in the first 10 to 14 days, estrogen levels go up. Then when the ovulation happens, progesterone is produced real fast and real high. And then it stays at a level. It's supposed to stay at a plateau. And then three days before the next cycle occurs, the progesterone levels drop, which allows the menses cycle to start. And then the hormones are low and the whole cycle starts all over again. With a PMS woman, that progesterone drops off prematurely. It's called luteal phase deficit. And so when the progesterone levels drops off before the three days before the next cycle starts, that's when women have all of this PMS. So we could very cleverly give women progesterone on specific days. And that was called bioidentical hormones. And this was back in the year 2000. We were the third bioidentical hormone lab in the country. So it's very new. 
salivary testing was very new. All the doctors were saying, oh, you know, this is, you got to take blood. You've got to do urine. You know, no, you can do, you can do uh, saliva. And you, can, and you can see this. So, but what I found in, in looking at adrenal tests and reproductive hormone tests was that you could give adrenal support or you could give progesterone and you could change people's lives quickly. But in three months, things were crashing again and people were back where they were and they got tired of taking these supplements. Mm -hmm. So then I started learning about root cause. Mm -hmm. and, and why are the adrenals not, why are they exhausted? Why do you see that cortisol levels low in the morning? And why does the woman have the PMS? Well, it turns out that all reproductive hormone problems are tied to the adrenals. Because the adrenals make DHEA, which is the precursor for the ovary to use to make estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone, and men as well. So the testes makes these reproductive hormones from the DHEA. And, and this had to do with this really sexy, you know, piece of nerd information about the uh, adrenal gland is that the adrenals are using pregnenolone, which is made from cholesterol. And cholesterol is made in your liver. So cholesterol doesn't come from eating butter and eating eggs. It's made by your liver. It's an essential hormone that is the precursor for all of your stress hormones. So when your body has to deal with stress, you need lots of cholesterol. And that cholesterol is converted into pregnenolone. And then pregnenolone is used by the adrenals to make cortisol. And, and the adrenals have to do with metabolism, they have to do with the immune system, they have to do with you know, uh, production of protein, fats, and carbs, they have to do with how we deal with stress, you know, they, they're the precursor hormones for our reproductive hormones, so adrenals are really, really important. And under stress, under chronic stress, not like the stress of the bear chasing your woods once in a lifetime, but just the day-to-day -day chronic stress, the the pregnenolone is usually used to make cortisol, which tells every cell in the body what to do. So cortisol is one of the most important hormones there is, but it also deals with inflammation. And so if we have a swollen elbow, we produce cortisol like a cortisone shot, you know, to reduce that inflammation. Or if we have chronic inflammation in our digestive tract, which today's modern people all do, then cortisol is being produced all the time, 24 hours a day, to deal with the inflammation in the gut. And then it's also any other inflammation in the body, as well as blood sugar control, right? Because cortisol has, and glucagon have a whole lot to do with blood sugar control, and chronic inflammation, and mental and emotional stress. So that pregnenolone, made from the cholesterol, is used to make the reproductive hormones. So if a woman has reproductive hormone problems, she's got stress, and it's called um, pregnenolone steal. Like you're stealing the pregnenolone. And that was one of the most exciting things I ever learned. And pregnenolone steal describes how under chronic stress, the adrenals are making the cortisol, and generally that pathway is shared you make DHEA for the reproductive hormones and you make cortisol. But under chronic stress, if your body is always low blood sugar, if you're not getting enough sleep, if you're not exercising, if you're stressed out at work, if you're stressed out in your head because of, you know, you're a victim of some injury, you know, some injustice, whatever, then I got it. Then the cholesterol or the pregnenolone is used to make cortisol and you don't make any DHEA. And so what you have to do is fix the adrenals to fix that PMS woman, not give her progesterone. If you give her progesterone, she feels like a million bucks. That's why women, when they're pregnant, feel so good is because the, the, when you're pregnant, you start, the placenta starts making lots of progesterone. So women get this wonderful glow when they're pregnant. And you can give a woman progesterone, she'll feel like a million bucks but it doesn't correct the problem. And, and giving the adrenal, pregnenolone, and, and maybe even some DHEA 
for some ginseng or some B vitamins or da 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 that supports the adrenals, but it doesn't take care of the root cause. So that's a long-winded way of saying that I learned to uh, deal with the root cause. And what I find now, having worked on thousands of patients and done thousands of blood chemistries, because that's what I learned to do in the hormone lab. I went on to study immunology and fatty acids and, and so doing lab work. And, and I can see if from lab work, I don't have to do a saliva test to see if your adrenals are exhausted. I can look at a blood chemistry. And I can look, you know, I also look at, I still do reproductive hormone testing. So you can, you can see if somebody has adrenal stress and it's common. And you can see if somebody's developing diabetes because their blood sugar, rather than being between 70 and 85, when you're, when you're after you've not eaten for 12 hours, it's oftentimes above 85, it's up to 100. When it gets up to 105, after not eating for 12 hours, then that's really a sign of diabetes. And then you look at cholesterol levels and you look at different other enzymes, LDH. And so there's, you can look, you know, you look at 10 or 15 different chemistries that gives you an idea that, ah, this person is either diabetic or they're pre-diabetic, which is called syndrome X or metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance. And so then after you see all that stuff, then one of the main things that I do with virtually 80% of the clients that I've got that are sick with everything from eczema to depression to irritable bowel to you know, psoriasis to autoimmune illness to thyroid issues to reproductive hormone issues, exhaustion, mental fog, brain fog, blah, 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 blah. For almost everybody, I got to teach them about blood sugar control. So in a perfect world, how would you go about taking care of yourself? Okay, we're going to spend five minutes because, you know, this is basic. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that blood sugar control underlies probably Everything. 80% of people's health complaints. Yeah. And people, even though I explain it to them and I send them information about it, it's, it's hard for people to comprehend. So I started off by doing that, the, the glucose tolerance test, right? Mm. Now, normally, if we get up, we should eat within about a half an hour to an hour after we wake up because our blood sugar is going to be low. And what I'm telling you is the best way to control blood sugar is with what you eat. It's not to put it on automatic and, and wear out your pancreas and your adrenals and, and result in insulin resistance and diabetes. Tea and, and that, that's that's everything. Everyone is is tired all the time. Yeah, and and the way to deal with that is there's a few rules. And one is to after you fasted, which is nighttime, you haven't eaten for ten to twelve hours. You got to eat within the time after you get up. You can't skip breakfast. If you skip breakfast, you're counting on that automatic system to work, and you're going to wear out your adrenals, and you're going to wear out your pancreas, you're going to wear out your whole system. So what about you, going to Dunkin' Donuts and getting coffee and uh, sugar in the morning? Okay, so that's the next step, is that those macronutrients, protein, fats, and carbs, Yeah. just like a two-cycle motor, an, an engine that required you mix oil and gas together for that, and now we have a four-stroke, so you can put oil separately into a motor and gasoline separate. They don't have to be mixed, but as a human, we need to mix our fuel. And, and that fuel has a certain ratio. It should be about half protein, a fourth carbs, and a fourth oil. After okay. we go about the formula, I'd like to just kind of dive into veganism and vegetarianism and, and people. There's, there's a lot of controversy right now just on, on meat. Um, well, there's no controversy. There's confusion. Well, planetarily, there's controversy. And... Well, I think a lot even, of people... Even that is confusion. Because well, are, if, we didn't, yeah. if we didn't have factory farms, There'd meat be wild wouldn't animals. be such a bad thing. Yeah. But when you've got factory farms, two-thirds of the weight of mammals is pigs and cows. But it, I read somewhere only, that... It, only one-third of the weight of mammals is humans. Eight billion people. And there's twice as much 
livestock. Cows and pigs as there are humans. I read somewhere that, you know, Native Amer or America pre, you know, just cutting down on the forest, the bison used to graze in numbers that succeeded or were equal to the livestock that we have currently. So it's oh, like yeah. instead of wild animals, we've just put them all in cages and, you know what I mean? And, and they're unhealthy. Well, but yeah, let's talk and, about that after, but let's first talk, let's first talk about just like what a perfect day looks the, like. The, the fuel ratio. Let's yeah. talk about the fuel ratio. So on your plate, you know, you should have a small plate, not a big, huge plate. Because yeah. really you should do about 750 calories in a meal. You should not eat to the point where you're full. You should... When you're done with your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks, you should still be a little bit hungry. Mm. That's intermittent fasting. That's that's really tough. What, what what people call intermittent fasting is crazy. Yeah. And and that has to do again with adrenals. I find reason, that overeating is a, is a the reason for it is because you're starving and you don't know where your next meal is going to be, and so people are are in this kind of rush. To like, I'm starving. I want to eat as much as I can. I don't know when my ne I don't have my next meal planned out, and so they overeat. Well, that so was the case maybe in, with indigenous people, but today, everybody knows that the the uh, food trough is yeah. just down the street, and and they're starving because they're malnourished, and they're malnourished because their digestive tract isn't working, and so they think they're starving. Well, actually. They don't necessarily think they're starving, but fat people are starving. When you're overweight, you're actually starving. And the reason is your digestive tract isn't working. And so your body's intelligence believes, whoa, I'm starving. So I better convert this fat into fat or convert the food that I'm eating, the carbohydrates, the fat and the proteins. I need to convert this all and store it as fat because I'm starving even though they don't know they're starving because they're overweight, but they actually are starving. But that's because the fuel filter, our intestinal tract is blocked. And so it's like a gasoline motor whose fuel filter is blocked. And so the engine, you know, dies out. Yeah. And, and so they got to clean their fuel filter. So overweight people don't need to cut down necessarily on their calories they need to improve their intestinal tract's ability to properly digest. So That's a whole other the, topic. The, so, so the plate of food is, you know, you need about four to six ounces of, of protein. And, and, and that protein is from anything with eyes and a mouth. So fish and poultry and, and So it's about a pound a pound a day is kind of probably about that. Yeah. Depending upon your weight and your activity level, you know, this changes. But when you have protein, you always have fat with it. So with that four ounces, which is not very much, if you take a cup and you put a hamburger and you mash it in to see how, how if you have a cup of meat in your hamburger, that's about eight ounces, right? A cup is eight ounces. Okay. So, you know, most hamburgers are, are half a quarter pounder which is four ounces, not very much. Mm. It's a pretty small, small piece of burger in there. Yeah. So with that, if you're having French fries, you should have French fries the same exact amount as the burger you're having. Density so if you're, having, if you're having a half a, pound, half a cup of, of, of meat, you should have a half a cup of French fries. What do people do? Double down, super yeah, size. Have, they have three or four times the amount of French fries. Yeah. And French fries are a below ground vegetable, so they're very high in sugar. So beets and, and potatoes and carrots, anything that's below ground, you should have that as a one, you should have a one-to-one -one relationship of that carbohydrate to your protein. And you should have at least a tablespoon of oil. Nice. And there you got the, there you got the three, the, the fuel three mixture. Macros. So what if so, you're not eating a below ground vegetable and you're eating kind of a dense veggie or? Well, if you're having, this is called the glycemic index and it was invented by the diabetic corp, uh, research 
which, which measures how quickly a food that we eat is, is converted into the sugar causing that spike. Okay. And so below ground vegetables and sugar cause the spike. Real I feel fast, like people are, have heard of this now, glycemic index. That's kind of a popular term. Yeah, if it's a high index like 100, it mm -hmm. means that it's converted into blood sugar really quickly. If it's a low glycemic value, like 30, then it raises your blood sugar slowly. Oh. And that's what you want. Yep. You don't want that blood sugar to go spiking. You know? I heard popcorn raises your blood sugar quicker than sugar or something. It does. Yeah. Popcorn, if you eat popcorn without oil on it, it will raise your, a, a bowl of popcorn will raise your blood sugar faster than if you eat a bowl of white table sugar. That's crazy. And what do people do at night? What about white bread or, or you know, grains? Grains are one, a one-to-one a -one relation. I mean, do they so spike your you, blood sugar? Real quick. Real quick, yeah. yeah. And, the re, and the way that you prevent grains or sugar from spiking fat is you eat it in combination, the fuel mixture. You have some protein and fat with it. So if you're going to have a candy bar, you have your chicken, your fish, your turkey, your pork, your lamb, your beef, and, and you have the same, you, you, you have a Hershey's uh, chocolate bar, no, or don't. an Almond Joy, or no, a um, Snickers bar. any of that. But if you're going to have that, <laughs> yeah. you eat that instead of your vegetables. Oh, okay. Because that's a carbohydrate. And if you're going to, if, what's really interesting, Stuart, is that when they went, in the concentration camps and freed the prisoners who were starving yeah. and gave them chocolate, half of them were dead in the morning. That's and crazy. what happens is I told you that insulin opens up the cells and allows sugar from the blood to get into the cells. When you're starving and you haven't had any carbohydrates and you're digesting your own protein, your own glands and organs and muscles for your energy, it's called that's that's intermittent fasting, you know. Yeah. That's uh, that's called ketone ketosis. Isn't that beyond? And, and, isn't that beyond yeah. ketones? Yeah, yeah. And and but when that happens, if you eat a bunch of concentrated sugar, mm. the the insulin that's produced allows such a rush into the cell wall that the the ratio of, of sodium and potassium on the outside and the inside of the cell is completely messed up and it pulls the outside sodium into the cell, which then causes a heart attack. Uh -huh. When people don't have breakfast or when they have a breakfast of donuts and, and sugar or they have cereal and, and juice and milk and toast and they don't have enough protein or fat. And then for lunch, they have, you know, again, just some, you know, sugary, you know, bread or something else. And then they, on the way home from work, they stop and they get a, a, co a Coke and a candy bar or a bag of chips. Well, they're kind of doing to themselves what happened to those concentration camp prisoners. Oh, yeah. And, and, and so the, that's, this, is that how the, early heart attacks happen? No, that's not. That's part, that's part of it. That's what, that's, that's, part of it but it's sodium, not, and yeah. guess what controls the sodium potassium pump the adrenals mm. and aldosterone that controls your blood sugar goes back to adrenals again so if if we eat the proper protein fats and carbs and we do it every two to four hours mm. it keeps the blood sugar from going up and down and up and down and up and down and it keeps the blood sugar warm. and when blood sugar is between 75 and 85 your mental acuity, your mental energy, your physical energy is, is, is excellent. Sustained. And, and, and you live a long life and you don't get diseased. But if your blood sugar is going up and down and up and down and up and down and you get diabetes or you're pre-diabetic, like three-fourths of people in the modern civilized word, world with industrial food, mm. they, that's why we're getting all the degenerative diseases. And then, of course, the pesticides and the chemicals and the antibiotics is destroying the bacteria and viruses and parasites and fungus in our gut. And so that also is why we're getting all these degenerative diseases. Well, that's huge. From cancer to heart disease to autoimmunity. So blood sugar control, eating within a half an hour of getting up, 
having breakfast, having a snack between breakfast and lunch, which has protein, fat, and carb, having Same lunch, dish. protein, fat, and carb. You never have a glass of juice by itself. If you're going to have a glass of juice, for one thing, you should sip it with a spoon because the digestive enzymes for the vegetables and fruits is in your mouth, your, your salivary glands. And if you're just drinking juice, you don't have to chew it. And so you're not going to produce the digestive enzymes to help produce, help to digest that carbohydrate. But if you're going to have a, a glass of juice, you have it with some protein or fat. You don't have it by itself. You don't eat an apple by itself. You don't have mango by itself. You don't have a smoothie. You don't go to a juice bar and get a, you know, apple juice with your kale and your, your superfoods. And, yeah. and, and, and think, oh man, I'm, I'm eating superfoods with my, with my juicer. There's something yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, I think people are thinking of nutrients and getting enough nutrients, but they're not necessarily thinking about macronutrients, yeah. protein, fats, and carbs, micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, and enzymes. Right. You need it all. But right. the macro are, are more important. And, and, and so then between lunch and dinner, you should have a snack. And I, I recommend people have half of what they had for lunch two hours later, mm. but they have their protein, fat, and carbs. So, and if you have to have, if you don't have time to have a meal, you, you snack on protein and fat. Oh, yeah. The Eskimos lived on protein and fat. They didn't have beans, they didn't have grains, they didn't have berries, they didn't have fruits, and they didn't have vegetables. They ate fish, and and seals and they had protein and fat and they, they lived to be long they lived to be long and healthy whale blubber i really like going to the store and getting teacher rooms i don't i don't think that the quality is very good um but it's like a, it satiates that like if i just eat carbohydrates like i i'm still full i'm still hungry and i feel my energy just like like drop kind of, in 30 minutes yeah I mean, I don't do it very often, but it happens sometimes. But if I... A, a candy bar is like the worst thing, but dried fruit. Yeah, dried fruit is awful. And I, I, so like I go kind of through maybe like I'll binge on something that I know I shouldn't for a little while and I'll see like the detrimental effects of that, you know, low energy and just like poor digestion. And then I'm like, okay. You know, mental. Inability yeah, men to think. Yeah. Mental is yeah. everything. I, I think that was what the coolest thing that I, that I experienced when we went down to Tijuana was the change in my mental ability like that <laughs> for the first time I could think clearly uh, and it just stemmed from being supported, you know, physically, emotionally. And, and ever since then, um, if I don't treat myself that way, I fall off and like fall off hard. Um, I always tell people who get started, you know, on a healthy routine, like, look, once you do this and once you treat your body really, really well, there's no going back. Your body won't allow you to mistreat it again. Like it, the symptoms are going to be so severe right now. The symptoms are like somewhat severe. That's why people are kind of dabbling in wanting to be healthy is because they know they have health problems that they're not like a disease, but they are, you know, whatever the symptom may be. Um, they know that they could do better, but I always say like, look, once you, once you really go the extra mile and treat yourself really, really well, your, your body's going to know what the level of, of treatment should be. And you're going to, yeah. If, if you go back, you get used to being sick and that's the way 80, 90% of people that are walking around today, they're sick. Yeah. They don't know. It. Yeah. They're used to being sick. I have a client that I just started working with in November. I met him at, he was talking to the pharmacist at the drugstore and I was getting a, a birthday card and I overheard his conversation and I, mm -hmm. he, he was asking good questions and the pharmacist was trying, but really just didn't answer the question. So I walked up to him and I said, Hey, you know, I overheard your conversation and he was shuffling. I mean, he could, he couldn't walk very well. Yeah. And um, I invited him to come over to my house. I, we did a finger prick and we did a, a food sensitivity test. And, and I, he was going to a doctor and I got copies of his blood chemistries. Mm. And um, this guy had been sick at least 36, I think. 
and he's a sound technician in the music industry. He plays and composes music. He's a, a, a empath. You know, he feels things very, very strongly. So he's an extraordinary guy. And, but he had chronic fatigue, uh, fibromyalgia. He hurt all over. He was on uh, narcotics for neck pain and low back pain. He'd had a bacterial infection for three years. When he was in fifth grade, his bowels were bleeding. He had gone out on two dates in his whole life because he was too sick to have a relationship with anybody. He lived in his recliner um, and was depressed, anxious, didn't sleep, uh, had no energy, worked every now and then, and had gone to so many doctors and like I said, was taking prescription narcotics. Uh, I talked to him yesterday and we did this in November and he stopped eating all the foods that he was sensitive to. I, I taught him about blood sugar control because he had blood sugar problem issues. So I, he was eating candy bars and candy. So I taught him about blood sugar control, taught him about the elimination of foods that he was sensitive to, and also taught him not to eat the same foods every day. So don't have eggs every day, don't have carrots every day, don't have you know, apples every day You know, to rotate the diet. I gave him probiotics high dose probiotics. I gave him an antimicrobial, an herbal antimicrobial to kill the yeast and bacteria and viruses and parasites. I gave him zinc and I gave him vitamin C. He had no money. So, you know, he, he you know, I helped him because he was broke. Mm -hmm. So I helped him with the cost of the consulting, with the tests. I gave him big discounts on the nutrients and, um, Talked to him yesterday, and he said a week ago he had quit taking the vitamin C because it was making him kind of dizzy, but the bacterial infection kind of came back a bit, and he started feeling funky, but he wanted to see what it was like, and um, he now hasn't eaten the foods that he's reacted to, controls his blood sugar, he exercises. I gave him a series of exercises for his neck and his lower back. doesn't hurt anymore. It's miraculous. So he does those religiously. But what I wanted to say is that he is clean enough now and healthy enough now that when he goes out for social events or goes to somebody's house and they offer him some food, he says no. Yeah. Oh. And, and because if he doesn't, he gets sick. Yeah. And that, that is, for me, the, what is the... Uh, the the club where you have sex in the airplanes mile high yeah the mile high club for yeah. me the mile high club is getting clean enough that if you eat something that's bad for you you can tell because everybody else craves the food that is bad for them they eat it all the time it's contributing to their degenerative disease and unfortunately people your age and younger are halfway to developing degenerative disease. I, this guy's 34. He's been sick since he was in fifth grade. Yeah. I've got two other friends that you referred. Both yeah. of them have been sick since childhood. They're only in their early 20s. I think and, most everyone know, I know is not healthy. Even my health friends that I consider that are like into the healthy realm, they're, they're still not. Well, that drove me nuts because the cancer patients that I was working with said I was never sick my whole life and now I have cancer. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much why I quit working in those clinics and I went and worked at the hormone lab. Mm -hmm. And at the hormone lab, I got to look at literally thousands, tens of thousands of tests because I was working with you know five doctors a day, five days a week, five different doctors a day. And they all had five to 10 patients that I was consulting with them because they'd ask, well, what do I do? I was doing more than hormone testing. I was looking at their blood chemistries. I was looking at their stool tests. I was looking at their, their, their female hormones, their reproductive hormones, their thyroid hormones. And from all of that, you know, we were, I, I got to recommend stuff. And then I got to test again to see if it was working or not. And what I learned, Stuart, is that people... The, the, quest, the answer to why these cancer patients said they were never sick is that they were never healthy. They, most people are unhealthy from their childhood. 
They don't yeah. grow out of their childhood illnesses. They get used to it. And people get used to being sick. They yeah. don't know what, what clarity is. They don't know what vitality is. They don't know what excitement is. They don't know what waking up and stretching and feeling like a million bucks and wanting to get up and go listen to the birds is. They go to bed tired. They, go, they wake up tired. They're tired during the day. They so in a perfect tired. world, how would you prevent that? Close down the bars. I mean, how, how Cause, enable cause people to make the right decisions, all those, you know? All those crazy people I was no, no, just no. talking about, just, they drink. And when we're, they drink, we're talking to people that want to get healthy. We're not talking them. to people that are going to the bars. And then they start talking loud when they're drunk because they got energy. Yeah. But they're, okay, they're, so they're, first, they first, get out to the bar and then they get that energy from drinking. And yeah. man, that's, that's a good thing. So for people that want to be healthy, what, how do they navigate the modern world so that they can feel good and they can wake up and feel you, great? You learn to control your blood sugar, mm -hmm. what we just talked about, essential. You eat throughout the day. You don't go long periods without eating. You don't do intermittent fasting. You don't, so, do, ke you, okay. you don't do keto. Okay, don't we know what we don't do. What do we do? What do we do? You don't do all those things. What do we do? You don't drink Congan water and alkalize yourself. You know? Okay, so it, you, for you, people that you, want you eat, to you do eat, this. You eat, you eat healthy food. You eat non or completely organic food. Yeah, quality you food. Don't, you don't eat, you cut down on your grains. You eat, you know, the macronutrients, the, the, the protein, fats, and carbs. The carbs are where most of your micronutrients are, your enzymes, your vitamins, and minerals. Yeah. So you eat a lot of berries. You eat a lot of fruits, you eat a lot of vegetables, but Seasonal. you eat them in the right ratio yeah. to your proteins and fats. You drink a lot of water, you exercise, you meditate, you, um, you laugh and you have a good time. And, and you don't eat the same food every day. That's huge. If people just stopped eating the same food every day, I've, I've seen dozens and dozens of people that couldn't afford any testing that just stopped eating the same food every day. And in a month, they were coming back into me and saying, oh my gosh, my aches and pains are gone. My energy's better. I'm yeah. so much, and I, I, I I'm, I'm have a sex drive again. We I should, sleep. We should do another video on food sensitivity specifically and immun immunology. And, and I, I'd like to do one on how the gut works you know, specifically like how does it function and what are all the mechanisms going on? I don't think many people I, really understand what I digestion does. I did a two does. and a half hour long nerdy seminar about that last night nice. that wiped me out. Yeah, I thought you wanted to do one about that today and then you're like, nope, I don't want to talk about that. Oh my gosh. But you know, like it's, people it's don't know what the gallbladder does and you know, they don't know what the duodenum is and they don't know what the, you know, they don't know what all these them yeah. is and they don't know what the liver does and they don't know what the pancreas does so if they you and, and knowing that you can feel it you know you can when you're eating you can be conscientious of how what you're you know how these foods are interacting with your body which I yeah think and your is, large intestine is really your small intestine and your small intestine is really your large intestine what do you mean by that the large intestine is four feet long yeah the small intestine is 20 feet long right oh i see okay but diameter it's smaller but yeah I get that. Yeah. Small intestine is 20 feet long. Um, and that's where all the absorption of nutrients come go. That's where all the chemistry happens. And then the large intestine is where all the water absorption happens. But I'm and sure it's your not and your bile gets, gets taken back. Re rebound. You know, one of the neatest thing is that when a woman is, have a, has a baby mm. and is breastfeeding, the baby yeah. needs the, the bacteria the healthy bacteria because it's colonizing its gut. Well, the, the woman that gave birth, her digestive tract samples and pulls the bacteria from the gut and sends it to the milk glands. It's crazy. And so the baby is getting its probiotics from breast milk. Yeah. That's really cool. And, and, and well, Major. you know, I like, I wanted to, have we talked longer than 15 minutes? Oh yeah. Darn it. Yeah. I was yeah. committed. I always got in trouble for talking too much in school. Oh yeah? 
I talk too much with patients. I know that, you know, they're, they're, I give them too much information. I'm supposed to work with doctors. Yeah. And I talk too much for doctors, frankly. But I think you know, it's just about efficiency, you know, like what is it that you're trying to say? And, well, and did really we cover blood sugar control. <laughs> we did. Yeah, we did. That was good. Yeah. So if people get that and if they really get that, yeah. that's 50% of getting well. Exercise. And the other, the other 40% is learning how to eat and take care of the gut. And if you're, you know, there's three systems in the body that are the primary system, digestion, detoxification, and hormone immune. And if those three systems are healthy, all the other little problems go away. Mm. If, you, if you focus on a disease, then you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're not going to get it. Yeah. All the cancer patients that I got, they're going to oncologists and they're focusing on killing the cancer. Yeah. Every one of those cancer patients, and I've worked with hundreds, has a half a dozen to a dozen other problems. And that's the cause of the cancer. And by not addressing those, but killing the cancer. Yeah. Is like giving a woman with PMS progesterone or hormones. Or a woman or, or a person with thyroid problems, thyroid hormone, or a person with with high cholesterol, a, a drug that kills your liver's ability to make the cholesterol. That's the dumbest. Pretty backwards therapy. thinking. This is what what the medical oh, industry right. just thinks that people are not going to do the things necessary. I mean, what is the logic? It's a customer that you can just give a drug to, like. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a drug. MDs are taught by drug companies at medical school. Drug companies fund the research, which didn't used to be legal 30 years ago. So drug companies fund the medical schools. They fund the research. They make lots of money on their drugs. They advertise their drugs. They spend billions of dollars advertising on the drugs, and they get back, for every billion, they get back $4 billion in sales. So do you think when someone's already sick, like asking them to take care of themselves for the first time in their lives, I mean, that's really like starting climbing the mountain when you're at below ground. You know, is that, is that? Well, the neatest thing, Stuart, is that I learned that there's no magic in getting well. It's, it's you, you step by step. You just start off the journey of a thousand miles begins with your first step. Right. So if someone has cancer, if someone is developing diabetes, if somebody has chronic fatigue, if someone's depressed, if you someone's on the waking up at two o'clock in the morning and not sleeping yeah. and waking up tired, you know, all those issues, they have eczema, they have whatever. Let's They're just constipate. They're constipated. Yeah. So many people are constipated. Yeah. Most everyone so I know. So many people have colds. If you have a yeah. cold, that's a major illness. People it's are exhausted. People aren't taking care of themselves. People aren't doing what they need to do. This video is about educating people what to do and how to do it. Um, yeah. So, and, and so you, you, I use tests, and those tests tell me what are the major imbalances, and then I use clinical wisdom to know where do we start. Because you might have a dozen problems. You might have heavy metal toxicity. You might have adrenal exhaustion. You might have hormonal depletion. You might have uh, dehydration, you might have anemia, you might have gallbladder dysfunction, you might have diarrhea, constipation, okay? Yeah. So, and most people have pretty much all that. Sure. And, and so then you've got to figure out, well, what do I do first? Right. And if, and if, and if you, but if you don't keep in mind the other 20 things, it's like you're a conductor with a symphony, you got 130 instruments, you have to listen to them all. And so when you're a physician, you know, a, a health counselor, you've got to look at the total body burden. What are all the problems? You gotta know all the problems. And then you have to have clinical wisdom to understand, well, this problem is because of that, which is because of this and because of that. And I have a question. What if you don't know any of the problems and you just do the foundational stuff? Will people blood just- sugar get... control and don't right. eat the same food every day and right. exercise. So if you don't know that anyone's would, that history. Cure, that would cure half of the people's problems. Okay. Those Let's, three things. That's crazy. That's some foundational information. That's yeah. really cool.
can you can you can you help someone without any supplementation without without any I'm testing doing it with at that, all that guy that i'm working with now he was a i feel fast i feel like the supplementation is to help people like make them feel better initially so that they can keep going but can you without any sort of supplements based on testing can yes but you can't help somebody with just giving them supplements like most doctors do nice. most nature I, I, has i like that yeah they give people supplements that they so in a way there is a foundational method to to health for that's everyone. why i was so excited about talking to you today i really was it's like i want to sh I, i've told you this i've told patty this i've told everybody this if i could teach the world one thing it'd yeah. be blood sugar control and i work with diabetics who are on insulin that go to clinics and they have not been taught how to eat. I know, no one is, Dad. No one is. It's not talked about. Aye, 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 aye. Okay, but let's finish real quick. But first, let's talk about veganism and vegetarianism and and how like that's such a popular movement for healing the planet, and I totally get it. And 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 what I've thought of a lot is like, look, you could be vegetarian, but you're kind of not fortifying yourself. So the next generation of kids, like your offspring are not going to be as vital as you were, you know, like, so yes, you can be vegetarian, you can be vegan, and you can make that decision. But like, as far as a evolutionary standpoint goes, like, we kind of, our vitality is passed on to our kids. And by going by em emitting a certain macronutrient, a lot of the times it's fat as well um we're kind of we're kind of setting ourselves up for for danger in the future and like generations before us kind of knew this you know like meat was highly prized and valued and like ev like the western prize foundation really you know sends this home all the time like every medicinal food that was a powerful food it was not plant it was animal and usually it was organs and these are what had like the really um so it was a superfood. No, there was no plant superfood. Plants are medicines and can do different things. But like, as far as fortifying yourself, it was always um, through animal products. Um, so as it's very popular in the health community now to be vegetarian, to be vegan, um, mainly to save the planet, which is really important. Um, but how does that correlate with like, how can you, how can you be a conscious um, consumer of, of, uh, of meat products? We asked a couple of questions there. You kind of yeah, diverged right. right there. I'll answer all of them. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, well, you know, I, like. As, as you know, when I was 18 or 19, I chose to become a vegetarian. For what in reason? 19, in 1970, because I, I read that cancer was because of eating too much meat. Okay, so that, that is and, still and that, that, that's what I popular idea. Yeah. And, and also the food at the college was lousy in, yeah. in Wyoming. Yes. USDA. I grew up on, on healthy grass-fed beef and, mm. and, you know, healthy, healthy food. And I went to college and was like, ugh. Lunch and I beef. noticed that the vegetarians were getting cottage cheese and cheese and vegetables and fruits. And I was getting these cooked, mushy nothings. And so I decided, to be, and I poked a vegetarian in the ribs and it's like, well, you look healthy to me, so I'll do it. I loved it. And then we moved off campus because the food was so lousy. Mm -hmm. And we, we got cookbooks and we started cooking. And so we had more fun cooking, you know, than we did going to college. Nice. And we made incredible. We had the vegetarian epicure where every recipe had 40 ingredients. It was like chemistry. Wow. So, so we really went to town making some incredible food. Um, and then, like I said, I noticed that if I didn't eat the right way, my energy was lackluster. It had to do with blood sugar. Because yeah. I was eating too many carbs. Yeah, and which I wasn't is kind of what you do when you're vegetarian. Wasn't getting enough protein and fat. And, and then, um, you know, I went to chiropractic school to learn more about nutrition. I didn't learn anything about nutrition. I knew more about nutrition than anybody. And they, everybody made fun of me because I was eating my millet and I was making my kefir and I was making yogurt. Eating you know, beef bone bee pollen and all those things and everybody just made fun of me all the time yeah i'd carry there, a pillow around because i broke my pelvis by the end of chiropractic school everybody was wearing there's a, a way, there's, there's a woman that i know and she's in her 60s maybe 70s and she's got so much vitality she's like she's a school teacher she's like involved with a lot of uh things going on 
you know, in the public spaces. And, um, and she's, she's, uh, she's like, what are you into? I'm like, I'm into health and just taking care of myself. She's like, I am too. And when I was in my twenties, people made fun of me and they're, and, <laughs> and look at me now, you know, like she's like still living vivaciously and everyone else is tired. And like, you know, it's like, they made fun of me well, for that, eating so avocados. What, what's interesting is that, you know, I had lots of earaches and I had lots of colds mm. and that continued in, in college and then in chiropractic school and then being a chiropractor. I still, I would get a doozy of a cold. It would go into my chest. I'd cough all the time. I was getting a lot of gas as a vegetarian mm. and, it, and it got worse and worse to where I remember sometimes with you going to LA, just burping the whole way. Yeah, and you, I, yeah. And I had friends in high school that burped a lot. And yeah. They had heartburn. And I'd never had heartburn. I know. I, yeah. I never burp. I never have, like, only if I eat concentrated sugar, like dried fruit. That's when everything starts to be like, whoa, weird. But normally, like, I don't have any of that digestive stuff. So I, Even hiccups know, and, or any and, of that kind of stuff. I, I, I was healthier than most because I didn't eat junk food. Mm. You know, when you're vegan or vegetarian, hopefully you're not eating junk food. So that helps. Well, and that's where the it's keto very diet popular helps. in the vegan community to say that Oreos are vegan. I think what happens too is like they're they're cutting out a bunch of the things that they say are bad meat, and so they kind of like want to indulge in crap. And it's like I'm doing this great thing. I, I find that a lot in the health world is people are trying so hard to do everything right that they'll treat themselves with some shit. And so well, you were them. you were raised by me. Yeah. What did I feed you when I was a vegetarian? M and M's. No, I'm just joking. Um, you ate a, a lot of tofu. A lot of soy. Tons of soy. Like Tons. soy, everything. Yeah, because of protein. Oh right. So, yeah, I was I was trying to get the protein levels up. Oh yeah. You know? yeah. And and we ate cheese. We ate really good. I mean, the quality, the variety was. We had like homemade grain pancakes, and um, we ate a very Healthy. And, and I and because of needing protein, I ate eggs. Yeah. So we had eggs and we had cheese, but we ate lots of tofu. We had lots of nuts. Yeah. Lots of nuts and seeds. Beans, so I was trying, soups. but then yeah. when I when I show up with Dr. Timmons, who has the hormone lab in like 1999, 98, yeah. he says, Chuck, you've got food sensitivities. I went, what? And that was the first time that you heard about that. No, I knew about it. When I did those glucose tolerance tests. You knew about it then. I, I told people about about food allergies. Uh -huh. And and I and I taught them about blood sugar control. I taught them about food allergies. I got them on antioxidants. Because they had and a lot of them had earaches. And I you know, I took care of hundreds of kids with earaches where I'd stick my finger down the back of the throat and open up the station tube. That was amazing. Yeah. But I also would do blood chemistries. I teach them about blood sugar. I teach them about antioxidants and I teach them about allergies. Well, the darndest thing was that I had the earaches and I never thought that I had any kind of allergy or food sensitivity. Big difference between an allergy, food sensitivity, and a food intolerance. Mm -hmm. Well, Timmons was the guy that really knew about it. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I don't. And then, but I was about 15 pounds overweight. My stools were loose. I'd been a vegetarian for 30 years. Mm -hmm. I had good health. You know, but I, I, and I learned how to take huge amounts of vitamin C mm. to ward off getting sick. Mm -hmm. So I prevented three fourths of my, my normal illnesses. And that's why I say, if you're getting a cold often, you got a problem. No, it, it's not just a common thing. You got to, why are you getting colds all the time? Cause yeah. you shouldn't. Right. So if you have and colds, a lot of people say it's, oh, it's I have kids and they come in contact with other viruses. Well, now that brings in this whole COVID thing because I know that, you know, healthy people don't go sick, but I also, I'm a human and I know that if I'm tired and I get around somebody that's sick, lo and behold, I'm sick. Hello. So yeah, if you're you know, exhausted, then you're susceptible. Yeah. Yeah. And so, a lot of people so are. When I, so I then quit eating oats, with rye, barley, and wheat. And I got a lot better. And after a couple of years, then I went, I quit eating corn. And then I did my first food sensitivity test and I had to quit eating tomatoes and avocados and celery and, um, 
and clams and pineapple and everything. Was that, Mexico? Was that, was that your first one? Well, no, but I was doing it down there. Yeah. And then I started eating it again when you were living with me. I started back on the avocados and back on the tomatoes. And I thought I was okay. Yeah. Then you and I took our trip down to Cabo and I ate guacamole with milk in it. And I ate the clams and I had the tomatoes. And I came back and my, the diarrhea was so bad I could barely get out of the tent to make it to the bathroom Damn. on our way back. Yeah. And then I, did, then I did testing again and I found out, oh, well, I'm now reactive to tomatoes and avocado and you know lemons again. and all this stuff, which I had gotten accustomed to again. Because when you were living with us and we were doing, doing everything, I said, hey, I can eat this stuff now. But I was sick, but I didn't know it. Then when I got really sick and I tested and I quit, then I felt like a million bucks. The time that I remember is when we first got started and uh, we went, it was Halloween and we went to Dr. Munoz's house and you ate that. Uh, and like thinking uh, traditional, like if someone offers you food, you have to eat it. And it's the same here in Hawaii too. Like if someone offers you food, it's like, a, it's a kind gesture and you're supposed to do it. And I don't do it. Um, I just go, oh, thank you so much, but I'm okay. And and you did it. And I did. I didn't eat that cupcake. And and you did. And I think it was like two days that you were like rolling in pain, like crying. I didn't sleep that night. I cried. Yeah. I, on the way home, I was burping like a volcano. And it, and Burton and Burton Goldberg, our biggest, my biggest referral source. I mean, yeah. the guy that is the publisher of Alternative Medicine sent me hundreds of patients. He's in town, and I couldn't make food for him. I couldn't pick up a box. Oh, I made food for him. Yeah, I was sick as a dog. I mean, Roman, well, I, Roman I eggs. I haven't had a cup. That was 20 years ago. You can bet your boots that I haven't had a cupcake since. Yeah, I believe it. That was that was horrific. And, and it's funny. And that was that was milk and eggs and well, wheat. Well, that's that's all the industrial poison of the world stuff and to do. Actually. Throw some corn in it. Corn syrup, like wheat, sugar, bad oil. Like it's everything that's bad in the world. So um, all the all the gluten free products uh, are just loaded with sugar. Corn too. I mean, it's gluten free, but it's got all the other crap. I I'll, and, I'll eat gluten free every once in a while, and I'm like, I feel just as bad. Not just as bad, but I still feel gross. So I just I stay away from that, anybody that has gluten intolerance. Yeah, has food sensitivities to a third of what they're eating, and as you know, a food intolerance is a developmental food sensitivity which i mean not not a food intolerance a food sensitivity and and it 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 you don't have reactions for two or three days and you get used to those reactions and then to nullify if you drink all the time you can handle it you smoke cigarettes all the time but if you do it every now and then it makes you sick well you crave the foods that you're sick that make you sick and you eat them all the time so anything that somebody craves and they eat all they eat all the time it's almost for certain that it that is. craving is killing them. And they're getting used to being sick, they're developing their degenerative disease, and by the time that they have real symptoms, they've been out of balance and they have tissue change for so long that they're already three-fourths dead. Yeah. So, you know, you're born in perfect balance, you get out of balance, and after being out of balance for quite a while, you have tissue change, after tissue change, you have symptoms, and after symptoms, you're dead. So by the time you've got symptoms, you've been sick and out of balance for a long, long time. I mean, even as a kid, I, I was sick all the time, and I knew it. I mean, I had digestive issues, and um, well, I knew it too. I, I, I was your dad. You know? I would get flus, and but you know, I'd have like weird yeah, pimples yeah. on the inside of my legs. Like there were definitely signs. Um, it wasn't as bad as. As my I'm other giving you herbs and vitamins and minerals and probiotics and da 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 da, da and I'm doing endonasals. But we, but my did, gosh, yeah. But what what we know now is way more potent and powerful, and it's about consistency. I think that's the ticket with everything. It's like if you know what if you know what to do, and you do it often, and you stay on course, that's where you get somewhere. Uh, for me, if I don't do what I know to do, I kind of feel bad, like, um, like self-esteem wise. 
And it's almost like if you know, like if you know better and you don't do it, you're going to feel, you know, bad that you've made a, a bad decision. But you, you have to get to the point where you've unmasked, you know. And that symptoms. takes months of doing it well, doing it right. healthy. And then when you're healthy, you can tell that what you've done makes you sick. Yeah. That's and the I, mile high club that we were talking about. Right. Yeah. But, you know, and the other thing, Stuart, is that our health is, a, is, a, is a, the accumulation of all the daily choices. So yeah. if you do all these tests or if you just give people an idea of what to do and they make the right choices, you and I saw stage four cancer patients that had tried chemo, radiation and surgery, were wealthy, had gone around the world. Also, they tried alternative doorstep, stuff. Yeah. Came, yeah, came to our doorstep pretty much last resort. And three fourths of them in one month were going, Whoa, yeah. Dr. Munoz has healed me. Well, yeah. it wasn't Dr. Munoz. Yeah, it I don't was know. what we did. Well, yeah. But, but, but they didn't understand that. They didn't understand the food rotation, the, the blood sugar control, the nutrients that I was giving them, the love that we gave them. And they left and they were all dead. Well, I don't think months. we made it quite clear. What what you know what I mean? Like I don't know if I don't know if they quite understand. Munoz was undermining everything we were doing. Well, let's not talk telling too. them that it had nothing to do with diet. Well, yeah. it drove me nuts because I've never seen better results in forty years because yeah. we did it all, well, yeah. and it was hard. I've never worked harder. <laughs> really? Ever? Me that neither. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, you quit. You, well, you I was twenty sick. years old. Six and months ready. and you leave me. I, I mean, and yeah. I cried for three days, and then was, you went off and got sick. I got really sick, but I also learned how to take care of myself. In uh, like I learned a lifestyle that actually worked. You know, like I'm not sick anymore. I got really, really sick, and so in that leaving the cocoon and joining like whatever everyone else is doing you know i learned how to kind of to take care of myself and regardless of what any, anyone else was doing i was going to do what i needed to do and i think that's a really um important aspect of of living a healthy lifestyle it's like no matter what is going on around you 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 know what to do you got to do it if you don't you're gonna you know have the repercussions so um so i still do that and and you know, I live in a beautiful place. I've got a lot of great friends and I still take care of myself regardless of what everyone else is doing. And I used to really talk Except about- Except last this. week. Except last week. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, true. That was a major indulgence for sure. But you know what? I showed up to this party and like there was, everything was cane sugar free. Everything was gluten free. Like it was all like vegan and like delicious. And I, there was two things that I like, I didn't know exactly what was in it and I still ate it. There was other two things that I knew there was sugar in it. I didn't eat that. But um, like, I was just amazed. Here's this group of people. We all show up and like all these desserts on the table I could eat, you know, it's just, I ate way too much of them. Um, and you didn't have protein or fat. I mean, I probably ate before I went over there, but. You didn't have protein and fat. No, I didn't. No, it was just pure sugar. I mean, dates and honey and maple syrup and. Um, but yeah, and I guess. And when you're healthy and you do that normal thing, you pay for it. Yeah. I, and I don't do that very often. Like I, I'm really tuned in cause I, I don't like feeling like, I don't like feeling bad. I know how to feel so good. I mean, like for me, like but getting a lack of sleep, you know, frustrates me just feeling tired. Does it, it doesn't feel right anymore. Like I want to feel. Have I told you about Wolvenzyme? Oh my gosh, it's my favorite new nutrient. Yeah. Let me let me let me can make this confession and then we'll we'll <laughs> call it a day. Well. Last year I fasted for 15, 12 days. Uh-huh. And on water. And when I'm fasting, you know, I prepare for it for a week. I stop eating, I just drink water, I do a, a coffee retention enema every day. So, you know, and I, the coffee is absorbed by the hemorrhoidal veins. It goes in the liver. I put in phosphatidylcholine, butyrate, some poured one oil, some electrolytes, and 60 billion bifidobacteria. 
So it's called a retention enema. It's not just a cocky enema. And I've tried, I fasted 50 times in my life. I've gone for 30 days with nothing, a couple times. I've done a couple dozen 20 day fasts. And I've done probably three or four dozen 10 day fasts. So I've done it every day, every year. Mm-hmm. And you know that. Yeah. And so I did it last year. And then it's apple season. It's in the fall. Mm. And Julian, a town about an hour away from us, has a you know great reputation for apple pie. And so we decided to go over there. And no we find a gluten-free, we get it on Google, we find a gluten-free apple pie. But it didn't it wasn't sugar free. Holy smokes. <laughs> so it had so Ouch. much sugar, it was ridiculous, but we just were kind of hungry, right? We were tired and we were hungry by the time we got there. And we your instinct just, just takes over. We, we had a gluten-free bread sandwich, which was junk, with junky cheese. And I ate the cheese because it's like, I'm hungry. Well, and you just fasted for a long time, so you feel great. And you're like, I've, well, my body can handle I think that's and, how. And, and then to drop it all off, they offered us a root beer float. Oh, no, with, really? With, with just who knows what kind of root beer and lousy ice cream. You did this after your fast? And about oh. a half an hour later, I'm kind of going, uh oh. <laughs> and so on our way out of town, we find this oh, no. gourmet restaurant, yeah. which is one of the best restaurants I've ever eaten in. And we had a grass fed um, steak which, and, and some Brussels sprouts, which were the best Brussels sprouts I'd ever had in my life. And that kind of saved me, kind of, but it was too late, too little. I, I got the protein after I had this crazy amount of sugar. Yeah. And, and so I got sick. So, so that, what were your, how did you get I, sick? What were your symptoms? I got a cold. Sore throat, it's congestion. My throat was a little bit bad, but mostly congestion, and then it got into my lungs. Wow. And so I'm 68. Yeah. I teach this. Yeah. I know this. I just work. It's not easy fasting. Mm, yeah. You know, it's it's not easy. I, I did love it last it. Christmas for 10 days, and I really it wasn't easy, but I liked it. I, I liked also the social fasting aspect of it as well. Mm-hmm. That was nice. But you but there's some things I can teach you about fasting that you didn't do. That yeah, would I'm I'm kind of lazy and, about it. And you really can't fast half assed. <laughs> if you do, you're you're not you're you're not gonna get the full benefits. Yeah. And I've done it so much. Yeah. And that's why knowing what I know about fasting, that's why I think that inner and knowing as much as I know about adrenals and everything else we've just talked about, right? That's why I think intermittent fasting is crazy. Yeah. And I think the keto diet is crazy. Well, the thing to do is just have and a I healthy diet. And I think being a vegetarian diet. and being a vegan is crazy. Yeah. And, okay. and, and it's not saving the planet because, you know, it's true. Factory farms and, and the way that meat is produced and chicken is produced and fish is produced, it's all wrong. So that's what's wrong. If that was corrected, it wouldn't have the negative impact on the environment. Yeah, I think we're moving back to small family farms, hopefully recognizing. I always say if there's one thing that is sacred in the world, it's food. And to commodify that and to industrialize food and turn it into like this commerce thing is is setting us backwards way, way quickly. The end of this is that I two weeks ago, I watched a special on PBS about blood sugar, about diabetes. Yeah. And it drove me nuts because there were people that didn't really know what we were talking about. And they talked about sugar, but they didn't really know about glycemic control. They didn't really understand it. What was the the point of the PB of the special? Was it just to educate or was it to try and it was to try to educate and to warn people that this diabetes and pre-diabetes is, is is really, really, really bad. Mm. And there was a girl who was 15 who was diagnosed as a type one diabetic and she ignored what the doctor said. And she just kept on doing what she's doing. Well, she's now 20. She's losing her eyesight. She's on kidney dialysis. She goes to doctors about four times a week. And she says, oh, my God, this is really a problem. But the problem was that the doctors that do know what I know, they had a hard time educating people about it. Mm. And so they were trying to reach people in the community and teach them. 
what I realized from this story as as long as grocery stores are selling this industrialized food, there's no, we're not going to change it. And then I met people that went to New Zealand and they just got back and they said the most amazing thing was clean restrooms everywhere mm. and no industrialized food. Literally 95% of the food that they ate was organic, was locally grown, and they don't have industrialized food in New Zealand. That's really cool. I met a so few, un a unless few we people. change what is manufactured and sold, we're not going to change the diabetes uh, epidemic. Yeah, I don't know if America is really going to make any sort of drastic changes like that. I, I think America is about money. It's about consumerism. And I we're open for business. Yeah, I the pandemic. We're I open for business. We want to get back to where we were, where we were chickens with our heads cut off, running around like crazy. Yeah, we want to go back. And, and any kind of a crisis is, is showing you and there's an opportunity for change. Yeah, America doesn't want to change. We want yeah. to hold on to what is killing us. Yeah, so you have a population of really sick people that are propagandized really hard, thinking that we're doing everything right. And um, yeah, I don't really foresee like. And we believe vitamins and minerals and drugs is medicine. Sorry. Yeah, so people don't really take into account their responsibility for their actions. And I, I've met a few people from New Zealand and they have compost piles, like every single person has a compost pile it's not like a weird thing it's like oh you have a kitchen you have a compost pile um it was like a no-brainer um yeah, and they have gardens they you and i lot, have gardens they I have spent one. they spend a lot of time outside like camping and recreation is like number one there's no pharmaceutical advertisements on television um there's but a lot in of australia there is only australia and the united states allow tv ads for drugs Australia is a, weird, it's a weird social experiment that, that goes on over there too. I mean, America is a social experiment. China is a social experiment. Europe's a social experiment. They're trying to kind of see which governance will accept the best, you know? Well, the premier of New Zealand is everybody's favorite in the world. Yeah. Yeah. She's, it's, it's, she rocks. it's like, and they're thinking forward and clearly and, and they're, what's cool is like New Zealand has a indigenous mindset still. Like they, they have they're a bit racist still. They're a bit yeah, racist. Yeah, of course. Um, but they're better, and yeah. they're and they're working on it. And everybody that goes there says it's the most beautiful place they've ever seen, and everybody wants to live there. But they don't let you in unless you have a valuable skill. Like you, you can't just go there. You have to prove that you're going to be a, a value, which it's is how anywhere, any community should be. You know, like at the top of a mountain, and you're 80 miles from the coast. That's as far away from the coast as you can get. 80, 80 miles. miles. You can still see the water. And they say the beaches make even Hawaiian beaches look crummy. Yeah. I mean, I've, I have friends like, you know. I don't know. I, I don't months. think that's possible. Hawaiian beaches, you can't get much nicer. Sorry. Yeah. I disagree with that. But the, they, they are. The pictures of the mountains and the beaches. The mountains, yeah. Island, I mean, they, they filmed the uh, Lord of the Rings there. But, um, yeah. The, I forget what I was just wanted Indu to say. but industrialized food it's a problem yeah and i don't okay, know but, but we we do have access right now at least to really great food if you've yeah. got a trader joe's near you i mean everyone has a farmer like a lot of people have a farmer's market around um like there, there's access i think to make the change you just have to make it a priority so if you don't have money, you know, you, you have to start a, a garden somewhere. So instead of watching television for the majority of your time, you, you work on this, this garden, you know, like uh, there's well, no you're, excuse. You're, you're, and you and I know how fun it is to feel healthy. I mean, I rode my bike today. I broke my wrist. So I'm kind of recovering from all that, you know, getting yeah. back to it. But, oh my gosh. And right now, Patty's home from work, and I gotta go food. We gotta, we gotta eat. It's like the best high in the world, just taking care of yourself, feeling good, knowing that your actions that you're doing, what you can expect the outcome. You know, I think a lot of people just live not even knowing what's gonna, how everything is affecting them. And when you really dial yourself in, um, you get to kind of see, like, oh, I did this yesterday and I don't feel so good today. Whereas a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know why I don't feel good because every single day they don't. 
you know, feel good. And some days they get thrown over the edge and get sick, but, but to be in full control, you know, like to be fully aware and in full control and doing everything that, you know, it's, it's very, very empowering. Um, Choices. That's, yeah, just, that's, this, that's how you heal yourself. You make the right choices. You don't well, do it with a superfood. You don't do it with a miracle drug. You don't do it with something all of a sudden, voila. You don't yeah. give away your power to a doctor to heal you. Yeah, you heal you, yourself. You, 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 yeah, you heal yourself. Okay, bye. Gotta go. All right, love you, bye. Fun story.